thank you all of, all of you for joining us. And I, I say us, I'm giving the share of this on behalf of my mother, uh, Sonia, and my brother, Keith, who's, oh, my mother's in Edgware, um, and my brother is in Israel. And obviously the three of us together have been overwhelmed by so many of you on this, on this, uh, on this Zoom broadcast, your kindness. I think my mother said she's been um, just blown away by the phone call she's received and, and the love and the care from all of you. And it really is very special for me and Keith and I, or mum, there you know, me and Keith there, Keith and I to realize that mum is so well loved and looked after by so many of you. And I think um, during the, uh, the Shiver Week, not only people came to spoke about my dad, but they spoke so warmly um, about my mum, Merva Estrem, and it's very special that she has so many wonderful friends in Edgware um, and in Natanya, who, again, I think I was there this afternoon and the phone must have rung three or four times with friends calling to speak, which is lovely. Um, but of course, tonight is, uh, well, the end of the Shloshim was on Shabbos. Um, so now is the, the beginning of the next stage of myself and my brothers, Ave Lut. Obviously, the uh, halacha says that after Shloshim, as long as someone says you're looking a bit messy, you can shave. Um, I actually don't know if my brother has, because Shulchan Aruch says, um, obviously it's the three weeks, but because it's a minhag, uh, during the three weeks, it's halacha during nine days. No, he hasn't as well. Um, so we both kind of had discussion whether we would, and I said, I'm going to stick it out uh, till uh, to Shabbat Av. Um, so thus, I'm still, though I'm told, uh, I'll come to it later on in the shir, uh, I look more like a rabbi now, but I'm not going to go there. I will go there later in the shir. Um, but uh, that's the other thing. And, and certainly, before I start, just two um, announcements I think I want to make in terms of uh, Mizrahi and what we're doing um, for Tisha B'Av, which of course comes up in, and this year is all about Tisha B'Av. Uh, we are holding or we're producing a movie called Tears of a Nation, uh, which can be viewed on our Facebook and YouTube pages at 8.45 on the day of the fast. So as the fast is going out at 8.45, there'll be plenty of uh, advertising uh, of it, but just to let you know now, so please tune in for that. And also Hamizrahi, the wonderful magazine that Mizrahi globally produces. Uh, we, we obviously we're not distributing it into shuls yet, but if you want to uh, to get a, a copy, just contact us and you can order your own copy, which will be sent to your to your door for Tishab Av to have some uh, beautiful reading to have before and after and in the afternoon of the of the fast. So as I said, the, today's is the end of Shloshim or Shabbos was, and therefore the shir today challenge or the lessons or understanding Tisha B'Av in the 21st century. But I want to start obviously with, with my father because my father really in so many ways inspired me to be who I am today. Um, his love of community, um, he was the FR of Kingsbury Shul for a long, long time. There's a, uh, I don't know if it's still there actually in the Shul, there's a um, little metal sort of plaque that has the list of all the uh, honorary officers of all the years. And when it comes to FR, my dad's name, R.M. Shaw, kind of takes like most of the, the third column. He, he was there for so many years as the FR. And also, as I mentioned to many of you at the Shiva, many of you mentioned to me from Kingsbury, he was the person who made from 1970 onwards when him and my mum moved to Kingsbury, who made up the Minion. He was there every night walking up the road, seven third make up that Minion, till myself and Keith, Keith first, then myself, could join him for three shores at the Kingsbury Minion. And certainly that dedication to community, that um, sort of understanding and, and doing it without any sense of complaint. He knew they needed him, he was there. And that was something that very much inspired me growing up as a kid in Kingsbury in terms of my love of shul and everything to do with, uh, with sort of Jewish life there. And also inspired me to understand, um, to really admire those people in my community of Stanmore who may not be, weren't the most religious people, but to them, coming to shul, attending shul was, was a holy task, and I really admired them for, for their dedication. And again, reminded me of my dad of those years when he would come and be there, uh, rain or shine. And certainly this event is being done, Mizrahi event, obviously, but it's being done uh, with two shuls, with Kingsbury shul and with Stanmore shul. Uh, Kingsbury, obviously, because that was my dad's shul, uh, my parents' shul, Keith and I, our shul, uh, growing up. And Stanmore was very much the shul that I was the rabbi of for 15 years, but I would say I gave a shit last week or two weeks ago to the Kingsbury group on Zoom. And when I mentioned to them that so much of what I learned at Kingsbury was what I used in Stanmore, in terms of the ideals and the, the vision that I was given by Rabbi Hall and the whole community uh, back in the 70s and 80s and, and early 90s, I used in the 21st century as a rabbi at Stanmore. Um, and also those two shuls together combined around about sort of 
35 to 40 years of my life. So I kind of feel that that's uh, the sort of two shuls I should have as part of this uh, Shlosh Shim Shir. And, and finally, of course, to my father, he would come regularly to Stambul. Um, whenever I spoke, gave the drasha, uh, he would walk over from, from, uh, from Edgeware to come and sit in shul, sit at the back. He never wanted to sit at the front, didn't want to make a fuss. Um, and I know a lot of the Stanwell members, some of who are on this group tonight, told me lovely stories of him sitting with them. Uh, obviously, you know, no one ever spoke during shul. That would never happen in any United synagogue. Um, but certainly he enjoyed going to Stanmore. And I thank all the people on this group who looked after him and made sure that those, those uh, trips to Stanmore were not just nice to hear his son give a drosha, but he enjoyed the atmosphere and, and the, the community as well. So that's going with the show. I'm going to try and do this in around about 25 minutes. That's, that's, the, that's what I like to do, half hour Zoom shim if I can. Um, and I'm going to share with you a source sheet as well to help you uh, sort of understand where I'm going. But um, really, we're coming up, we are in the, the three weeks, the, the saddest time in the Jewish year. We're coming up to Tisha B'Av next Wednesday night, Thursday. And the real focus of Tisha B'Av is, of course, the Chobah, the destruction of both the first and second temples. And what's interesting, the Gemara Yuma, and everyone knows this one, the Gemara Yuma famously tells us the reasons why the temple was destroyed. And everyone knows this from a, from a young age you're taught, the first temple was destroyed because of... Um, Immorality, idol worship, and bloodshed. Those are the three reasons given in the, in the, the Gemara Yuma. And that's kind of pretty serious. And the second temple, it, the one we're told in Yuma, is Sinat Chinam, baseless hatred. And that's pretty much what we, we, we talk about. A lot of the drashat around Tishbab about this idea of unity, of coming together, of Avat Chinam, of loving each other regardless of anything, because that's how we're going to fix the mistakes we made in the past. What's interesting is we only seem to quote that one Gemara as the sole reason for destruction. However, the Gemara in several other places gives many other reasons why, we should, why the temple is destroyed. And what's painful for me, we're going to go through, there are nine other reasons given. We're going to go through them very briefly. And what's painful to me is we may say that Sinat Chenam is still out there as a Jewish people, though I think, thankfully today, there is a, as a Jewish nation, we, I think we are in many ways quite unified in, in many ways, especially when people come to attack us. But these other nine things that the Torah tells us, Gemara tells us the temple was destroyed because of, I don't think we've really uh, learned our lesson. And so many of these things are so prevalent in the Jewish world today. And my hypothesis is, if we can fix these problems, we can fix these nine areas that Gemara tells us with the reasons of destruction, then we can maybe fix the world and make it a better place and rebuild uh, the third temple. So what are they? So I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully this will work. If it doesn't work, I apologize, but hopefully it will. Um, firstly, I want to, sorry, I should have shared this first. This is a lovely picture, I'm just going to show you, uh, of my dad um, with Lieli, with his, um, his first great granddaughter. He was so excited uh, uh, when she was born. He was already, unfortunately, um, his dementia had taken hold, but he still was so excited. And when they brought, uh, and Micha brought uh, Lieli to see him, he was so excited. And I remember what was very exciting for me was had the ability to, one of the last times he came to Emet, to the minion in Edgware, um, I called him up to bless him for being a great grandfather. So for me, that was the picture I wanted people to see of him. He was, you know, he was, he was just so, so happy when he was with family and to have a great granddaughter for him was, was very, very special. Um, but now onto the shear in, in his memory, um, when I find it, which is here. Okay, so we're gonna go through the different um, Gamarat. I'm probably gonna leave it on the screen um, as much as possible so you can see. And the first one is in Bav Metzir. The most are in Shabbat, but there's one in Bav Metzir. And the Gemara says, Yushlam Ella. Yushlam was only destroyed. Why? Because they judged on the basis of Torah law. That's a very strange thing to say. What, what, what is wrong with a bed din judging on the basis of Torah law? It's what we do. So the Gemara questions that. What are you talking about? What's wrong with that? What are they going to judge? Are they going to judge in, in an arbitrary way? So the Gemara clarifies. So what's the first area? What is that idea telling us? What's the first point the Gemara is saying? It's telling us, and one of the things I learned from the many Torah giants that I've worked and, and learned by, halacha is sensitive. Halacha is very, very particular. It's not a one-size-fits-all. And if tadin to judge beyond the letter of the law, is understanding the case you're dealing with, understanding who you're talking to. Rabbi Hall taught me this at a young age. I remember I was talking to him about when I was doing my smicha. And he told me about his smicha. 
His smicha was in a different era to mine. What did he have to do? He had to do as part of his smicha, he had to be given in those days, uh, people would bring their chickens to the rabbi to check if the chickens were kosher. Again, by the time I came around, we didn't do this anymore, but that was what a rabbi had to know back then in the 1950s. So Rabbi Hultomo in his smicha paper, they produced or they showed a list of examinations of the chicken, what the chicken had in terms of it's this and that. And then it said, is this chicken kosher? That was the question on smicha. But he said to me, it then said, is this chicken kosher if A, the person is poor, B, the person is not religious, C, the person is wealthy, D, the person, meaning the halacha itself, kosher or treif, depends. Well, obviously, if it's not kosher, it's not kosher. But there are certain things in a chicken that we say are non-kosher, we're being macha, being stringent to, to basically allow all day out, all opinions to say, you'll be okay. But sometimes you need to be lenient. Sometimes if somebody is poor, if this chicken they brought to you, you know what? It's not ideal. It's not a mahadrin chicken. But you know what? It's certainly kosher. But if I rule by Torah law, it's trife. Oh, no, no, no. If no, think beyond that. Think of the bigger picture. Think about what this person is. And so many times we have to find in, in, in Judaism, how much grief would we not have if we, as Rabbonim, as communities, would judge Livnim Mushur Tadim, would try and see things beyond, understand the bigger picture, looking at the person individually, not simply clicking and finding a link and saying, oh, that's halacha. We're going to get later on into the sheer understanding of the complexities of halacha decisions. But certainly the driving force should always be understanding that everybody is unique. And we have to look at everybody in a different way and understand what works best for them. That's the first of the nine things. The second one is probably a much more common issue. We're going to take these two together. And in essence, these two sources, these two um, Gemara's, and by the way, what's fascinating for me is in Shabbat, Daf Kuf Yotel Amud Bet, I am a bit behind in Daf Yomi because of what's been happening. And literally, I'm about 10 or 15 Daf behind. This is a Daf I just did yesterday. I just did, so you'll know those who Daf Yomi, I'm, I'm 15 Daf behind. I've got to do a lot of catch up. I hope I'll get there. But what is it talking about? Two things here Chilul Shabbat and Kriyat Shema. And these are our personal relations with Hashem. Shabbat and Tfilah. Shabbat and Shul, whatever you want to call it, these are things that really drive the Jewish people. Without Shabbat, without Tfilah, without Shema, what are we? And the sad thing today, and it's, it's really a, a mark of the modern world, most people do not keep Shabbat in the Jewish world. Most people do not engage in regular Tfilah. Why? Not because they're rebelling against anything, not because they're trying to say to Hashem, we don't believe, we don't want to know. They just don't know. There is tremendous ignorance out there. The lack of knowledge and lack of inspiration can lead to a complete warped viewpoint of Torah. And that's a tragedy in itself. And as I said before about my beard, the amount of times in my career when people have said to me, but you're an Orthodox rabbi, meaning the things I may have said or the way I may have looked at things, as far as I can say, that can't be orthodoxy. How can orthodoxy be you know, pro-Israel? How can orthodoxy be pro-science and, and in favor of uh, a secular education? How can orthodoxy be so you know, open-minded in many ways? But that's how I was taught. So that's what I'm teaching. But the understanding is people don't know. There's a tremendous ignorance in the world today. And again, one of the things that I blessed my father and my mother for doing to me was to bring me to a community like Kingsbury, where I could learn and experience and see from a young age what Shabbat was, what regular shul davening was, and then eventually, therefore, what Kriyat Shema Shachat Avit was, what eventually Shmirat Shabbat was. Because again, Shmirat Shabbat doesn't come in one week. You first got to love the concept of Shabbat, and then from that, Shmirat Shabbat is a natural occurrence. Once you realize the importance of what that day is, it comes through, and it comes to fruition. So the second one, Shabbat and, and, and Tefillah, are things that we really have to work on as a community. And Shabbat, as I've always said to many people, Shmirat Shabbat means not just the observance of Shabbat, not just a Shema Shema, but also Zachor, to remember Shabbat as well. Zachor Shema means to honor Shabbat with Kiddush and Zmirat, and the whole way we make Shabbat around our Shabbat's table, something exciting and something fun and something joyful for all the family.
Next one. Rabbi Hamnuna says, Machnu Amma Rabbi Hamnuna, Lo Chava Yushalayim, Ela Bishvil Shebitlu Ba Tinakot Shal Beit Rabban. Only destroyed, says Rabbi Hamnuna, because school children are interrupted from studying Torah. And again, we know that children are our future. How many times have we heard it, both in records by certain um, singers, but also understanding of the, the lectures we've given, or Josh we've given about the importance to pass on to the next generation, Jewish continuity, and all those sort of things. And yet we've got to make sure, especially today, that the Torah we are teaching is relevant to their lives and authentic to our traditions. It's a challenging combination. It's not easy. It's not easy to find a way to get through today's generations. We'll come to later on with the way the 21st century has panned out. The way people have so many distractions. Teenagers today, it's not like they used to be. My main distraction, you know, when I was growing up was maybe uh, three channels. And then channel four came in, it was like oh, four channels, like real, real uh, progress. And then later on, we had a video recorder, sort of when I was like 15, 16. But it just is not what it is today. Today, when kids literally have a mobile phone and Snapchat and Facebook and Instagram, everything, it's not so much about the education. It's about the experience they can have. It's about making sure they fall in love with Judaism. And that's part of the problem sometimes with education. If we're just teaching them facts and knowledge, it's not enough. We have to make sure we are also making them experience what those facts are. Don't teach them Hilchot Shabbat, let them experience a Shabbat. Don't teach them what Sukkot is, let them live and dwell in a Sukkot. Don't teach them you know, what, a, what a sort of... Uh, Tisha B'Av is let them experience a community coming together to, to mourn and to fast and to be part of something national and, and, and meaningful. It's got to be more than simply teaching. School has to be an ex in, in a, um, or Jewish education, I mean, it has to be an immersive experience that really is touching all our senses, makes us feel part of something way beyond simply something that's a book or a subject or an exam. Ama Ula. Ula says, This, in many ways, is the one that upsets me the most. It says that it was destroyed because people had no shame before one another. One of the hallmarks of the Jewish community for many, many years was it didn't matter if you were religious or not religious. You had this respect for Judaism. You came to shul, Whatever it was, you put a kippah on your head. There was that sense of duty, sense of tradition. I think now certainly in many parts of the Jewish world that there is no busha anymore. There is no sense of shame that people are blatantly, you know, not observing or not doing or not keeping. People should feel this sense of not, not guilt, but a sense of, okay, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet, and that's okay. I think my dad was a classic example of this. He, he never tried to hide who he was. I think my brother said it beautifully in the Hesper he wrote for, for Dad. Dad always was who Dad was. But we always knew that he would never try and be something he wasn't. He would never try and sort of, if he came to Shul, keep on his head. And interesting as well, he wasn't a religious man, but he came to Israel, made Aliyah, he always wore Kippah. He kind of felt he's in Israel, and I think obviously mum showed something to do with it, but he felt he's now in the Jewish, Jewish land, he's going to wear the Kippah at all times. Something he did, and something I noticed, and I felt, you know what, that's my dad, he understands you know, what it is. He had a real respect uh, for Torah, real respect for the tradition. And again, Rav Ula is say, saying because people weren't ashamed anymore. And even more than that, in terms of what the mirrors, what society has turned into, the fact that we know what, what kids, what anyone can, can, can access now through their phones, through the media, tremendously damaging to people's sort of value systems, what is now out there. Um, and we, as the mainstream Jewish world, um, for us, it's, it's, it's a challenge. We engage ourselves with the world. We engage ourselves with, with all the media. And then we've got to be even more aware of how we have to really understand what, what the damaging happening there and what the things that can really affect us and our children and our grandchildren. I'm Rabbi Yitzhak. L'chav Yushalayim. Ella. Bishvil. Shahushu. Katon. Vagadon. Because they equated small and great citizens. What's the concept here? What, have we, what are we doing today that's, that's tremendously damaging? We don't expect the average person to be able to do a, a neuroscience thing or a complex tax calculation. 
We understand there are qualified people who we pay money to, to do these things. We need ourselves defended in court, we get a top lawyer. We need a complex tax, we get, we get an accountant. We, we, we need to have an operation that's really complex, we get, a, we get a top surgeon. Yet when it comes to Judaism, somehow we feel anybody can say what they want. People with very little training, knowledge or grasp of the huge complexities of Jewish law are able to speak. We're able to say what they think. And the fact is, well, why is that? Why can we have in all other fields, we understand experts are the ones who we listen to. But in Judaism, no, anyone can have, have, have a say. And it's a real tragedy. We don't understand what Torah is and what Torah, how much it takes to acquire Torah. For me, for my rebellion that I look up to, that I've learned from all my life, a realization that they knew vast amounts and certainly the job of a rabbi is not always to paskan aracha. It's to also understand what are the limits of his knowledge and to ask, therefore, somebody who has greater knowledge than him. And that's the idea of recognizing sort of the great and the small. And a lovely story from my smicha. I remember when I got smicha from my rav, and I said to him, I feel very embarrassed now, rav, because, you know, you're, you're my rabbi, now we're both called rabbi. So he said to him, I think I feel when I speak to rav shach. Of Shach was one of the Gedolim of the generation. But understanding that, yes, we're all called rabbi, but we're not all the same. There is definitely people, rabbis, with greater knowledge and greater understanding than I have, and I rely on them in so many ways. And that's, again, one of the reasons we have to understand that Judaism is not something you can just make up on the fly. It is based on thousands of years of study and discussion. And yes, of course, in the 21st century, we've got to make sure it's relevant, as I said before. But we do that without compromising one iota, the Masora has been passed down. And that's why change happens, but it happens within the beauty of the Torah system. Rav Amram, Raid Rabbi Shimon, Baba, Amram Shimon Baba, Amram Rabbi Hanina, Lachava Yushalayim, Ele Bishvil, Shloch, Chichu, Ze, Ed Ze. Again, think about this today. Think about the moment, the, what the world is talking about, how this Gemara is so relevant. People did not rebuke one another, did not say to somebody, what you're doing is wrong. You have to rebuke each other. And of course, we know it has to be done with kindness and so on and so forth. We've got to a stage in our PC world where you cannot say anything for fear of offending. I remember I was once in Leeds giving a shear to the university students a couple of years ago. And they asked me to speak um, about sort of why there's so much disillusionment or, or why a lot of Jews are giving up on the Jewish state on Israel. And I brought some statistics from the Pew Report. And the Pew Report shows that as you go down the denominations in America, um, and I quoted that amongst Reformed Jews, only 10% actually still light Shabbos candles in America, according to Pew Research and only 25% or so actually feel that Israel is a vital part of their Jewish life. So I said the statistics, and somebody in the room said, I'm sorry, Rabbi, I'm very offended by that. I'm a reformed Jew. I said, what do you mean you're offended by that? It, it's a statistic. You can't be offended by a statistic. You can be upset by what it's telling you about what's happening, and I'm upset as well about hearing this. But you can't be offended. And we've got to a stage now in the world, with this whole cancel culture and, and the tremendous enmity coming out of, um, of the extreme left, where literally you can't say anything for fear of basically offending and therefore being completely canceled and splashed all over Twitter. And it, it, it's a terrible, terrible shame. It's tragic. It caused the destruction of Shalai because we as Jews couldn't rebuke one another, couldn't say, I'm sorry, what you're doing is wrong. I don't agree with you. And again, when it comes to reform and, and, and all these uh, Judaism, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying I love every single Jew but I'm not gonna love every single Judaism. I think Reform Judaism is not, is not correct. Now again, I've had many, many discussions over the years with Reform friends and, and, and Reform colleagues about this, and we've discussed it. I don't think it's offensive to say you disagree with somebody, but it never used to be. But in today's world, suddenly you've offended me because you disagree with me. No, I wanna have a discussion with you, whatever the field is, in politics, in, in Israel, in, have a discussion. But they didn't. They didn't rebuke one another. We have to today be able to rebuke, but do it in a way with kindness, with love, and with a real means to try and find the truth in the situation. Many times I've had discussions, I've said things, and people have come back to me and I've realized, you know what, I'm wrong. Good point, whatever it was, whatever situation it was.
אמרו יהודה, לא חרב הירושלים, אלא בשביל שביזו בה תלמידי חכם. Yushalayim is only destroyed, says Rabbi Yehuda, because he disparaged the Torah scholars. And this links in many ways to the one I said about the small and great, the Hushu Katan Vagadol. Of course, there are rabbis out there, there are teachers out there that we will disagree with, that we will be upset with potentially some of their rulings. But there's a way as a Jewish person to disagree with somebody. There are Gadolim out there, great rabbis in Israel, that have said things I fundamentally disagree with. I think they are wrong in what they've said. But it doesn't mean I'm not going to respect them for their greatness in Torah. But I think politically what they've said, X, Y, and Z, is, is, is wrong. But there's a way of doing it. And just because some rabbi says something that you think is mistaken, you can't try and ban him. And, and we know in this country there's been tremendous damage done by, by real hatred for one another. And that's something that has to stop. It's again the same idea of rebuking. You should be able to separate the disagreement of something someone has said with realizing the greatness of that person in terms of the, of the rabbi. And again, that's something within, again, the Mizrahi world. I'm, I'm so determined to make people realize that the Haredi world is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful dynamic worldview. I don't agree with it in many ways, but it doesn't mean I don't have the utmost respect for the Rabbeim and the Hashkafa and the, and the way they live their lives. And to realize there are 70 facets of Torah, there are 70, 70 facets of Torah within the Torah Hashkafa. And therefore you can still respect tremendously the Rabbonim and disagree with some of their rulings. It's understandable. But again, it's this balance of doing it in a way that's covered with love and with respect. There's so many of these areas, that's what it's about. It's about love and respect and kindness and connection and not about attacking people, but allowing yourself to disagree and have debates and discussions. And that brings me to the final piece of the Gemara. And again, by the way, these Gemaras I've quoted, I've only quoted the first bit. They, they give Pesukim and they expound on it. There isn't time. Again, I've cut this shit down from an hour to, to half an hour. But the last source, to me, is, is beautiful. Rabbi says, Amar Rabbi, Rachava Yushalayim, Ela Bishul Shepasko Mimena and Shei Emuna. Jerusalem was destroyed only. Why? because there were no more people of integrity. The final statement of the Gemara speaks volumes about what we need to achieve. Without integrity, without people we can look up to and admire, we have no chance to build the future of our people. Role models, a line I learned in B'nai Akiva, Dugma Ishit, personal example. People, kids, adults, everybody needs to look up to people and to say, that's Torah, that I respect. Our leaders have to be people of integrity. I will never forget my Rav, Rabbi Zimman, who was the gate of Rav, he's now the head of the Federation. I remember the day I got Samicha. I was very nervous. It was a responsibility I now had to be a rabbi. And he called me around to his house. And to understand the Samicha I did, it was a Samicha that he gave through all Samach in, in America. I was the only B'nai Kiva boy in the Samicha class. Uh, my joke, or his joke, is that the, uh, I'm the only B'nai Akiva boy to get smicha from the gate, said Rav. He was a wonderful teacher, a wonderful Rav, a wonderful, inspiring human being, a real person of integrity who I learned so much from, not just his immense Torah knowledge, but the way he held himself as a father, as a Rav of a Kehila, as a teacher of Torah. But he called me into his house. I will never forget this. He says, come with me. And he took me into his main room, into his dining room, lounge area. And he showed me a big picture on the wall. And he said, what do you see? It was a picture of the Chofetz Chaim. And I said, I see the Chofetz Chaim. He said, look deeper, what do you see? I said, Rav, I, I see the Chofetz Chaim. He says, no, you don't. You see a lie. I said, excuse me? I said, that, that's a Chofetz Chaim. He said, what's he wearing? I said, he's wearing a black jacket and a you know, hat and a white shirt and a black tie. He said he was a peasant from Radin. What you're looking at now is they've dressed him in a way that would look for today's Jew. Always be who you are. Always be who you are. And for me, that advice I got then was to be myself, but to be a man of integrity, to make sure that what I believed in, what I spoke about, was something that I lived. And for me, that respect, I remember when I asked him, 
many years ago if um, I should leave the United Synagogue and start Mizrahi. I was, I've been asked by Rav Perez to, to start Mizrahi UK. Should I do that? He was the one who said to me, absolutely. He said the United Synagogue needs uh, talented young modern Orthodox rabbis in its communities across the country. He said it's a wonderful thing to do. But he then said to me, he says, but make sure your job is to always, always praise the hashkaf of Mizrahi, not to damage anybody else, not to knock any other hashkafot. And again, a person of integrity, people who inspired me like Dan Lopian, people who just were so together, so confident in who they were, they were never ever putting anybody else down. It was about showing us the beauty of Torah. And they weren't scared about any other ideologies in Torah world, because far as I'm concerned, there are 17 faces of Torah. We all have something to contribute to the, to the, to the Torah world. Don't be scared. Don't be sort of worried about people to this way or that way. And for me, that was an incredible lesson he gave me. So if you think about it, and I'll sum up here, the solution, building better Mikdash, the solution to bringing back, bringing Mashiach and bringing the world to completion is to keep Shabbat, say the Shema, inspire our kids, value our leaders, rebuke our nation with love, live lives of modesty, dignity, and privacy, be people of integrity. That's it. That's all we have to do. And when I think of my dad, when I think of my dad of what he was, he was somebody who loved Shabbat. He loved Shul. He certainly inspired his kids. He was somebody who looked up to his leaders. He looked up to his rabbis. He was somebody who managed, not often, to tell me off for things, but he was a modest person. He was somebody who everybody loved. Everybody loved Uncle Ricky. Everybody loved Ricky from Kingsbury. The messages I've got over the weeks and people who knew him said that. And he was a person of integrity. What you saw is what you got. You got a smile, you got a wave, but that's what you got. So much of Tisha B'Av, so much of what we have to fix is Ben Adam Lechavero. Why do we say Sinat Chinam? Because so many of these things, if we don't do them, it leads to Sinat Chinam. Sinat Chinam is the Klal. The Pratim are in these Gemaras. If you're somebody who focuses on your children, somebody who is a person of integrity, who doesn't judge people, who loves people, that's the reverse of Sinat Chinam. And that was my dad. So for me, when I look about the challenge of the Shabbat for the 21st century, or the message of Shabbat for the 21st century, I look at my dad's life, I look at the life he led, so much was Ben Adam Lechavero. So much was making sure that he had a, a Shem Tov, a good name. That when people speak about him, spoke about him, still speak about him, it's with that sense of, as my brother said, or well, someone said to me, actually, no, it wasn't my brother. Someone said at the um, Shiv, I think it was Rabbi Dav, he was a gentle gentleman. And I think that sums him up perfectly. Somebody who understood what it was to be a human being, was to love everybody, help everybody, be kind to everybody, and just have a smile. And for me, therefore, that's why it's perfect for his shloshim, in his memory, to give this shir. Highlighting the Gemara, highlighting those areas of the Gemara that are teaching us how to live better lives, how to improve our lives, how to improve our communities' lives. I'm realizing that people like my dad, through their existence on this planet, through their lives and their life that they lived, that they gave, and they had a connection and an ability to be that person, to inspire the next generation and to inspire a lot of people who knew them and loved them. On behalf of my mother and my brother, thank you all for attending tonight. I wish everybody a Tzom Kal in 10 days time. And please God, it should be the last time we have to fast because we say Tisha B'Av um, is the day that eventually will become, please God, the birth, the birth day of Mashiach and eventually the Gula Shalema in the building of the third temple in Hara, the Amenu.